It feels like every other day we see someone throw their entire life's work away because they use their money and power to fulfill their darkest desires. Vince McMahon was the mastermind who bought his father's wrestling promotion and turned it into the multi-billion dollar company we know today as the WWE. Many of the ideas, characters, storylines, legendary matches, and controversial moments can be credited to Vince's sick and twisted mind. Not only did he run the company, but he was also the most notorious villain who played the character of the psychopath businessman. We would later find out that this was no character. Vince was just as evil off screen as he was on screen. Recently, horrifying accusations have come to light regarding Vince's sick ways. Brutal assault, crime cover ups, and human trafficking are just a few of the many reasons why he has formally stepped down as the CEO of the WWE. Today, we are going to look into the unraveling of Vince McMahon's life and career. And show all of the obvious warning signs we missed along the way. The wrestling business operated similarly to gangs in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The United States had defined territories that different wrestling federations controlled. Vince McMahon's father, Vincent, owned the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, which controlled the northeast region of the United States. This was home to stars like Bruno San Martino. He also had the Mid-Atlantic region, which covered Virginia and the Carolinas, home to Ric Flair, and the world-class wrestling promotion in the South, which was home of the Von Erich brothers. Wrestling had nowhere near the mainstream popularity it does now. There wasn't much money in the business, so each promotion was protective of their territory. You only promoted shows within the territory you controlled. The National Wrestling Alliance was a governing body that protected the territorial integrity of the promotions. They also helped with talent acquisitions, cross promotions, title matches, etc. Vincent McMahon Sr. was an honest, hardworking man who traveled the country developing relationships with the heads of other promotions. Vince was enamored with the world his dad created, and one day dreamed of taking over the business. But his father didn't like that idea. Vince lets his father know that he wants to wrestle. His father is adamantly opposed. He wanted me to have a more secure future. He wanted me to be an accountant uh, or, or an attorney or something like that. And I really wasn't cut out for, for any of the above. In 1972, his father finally gave him an opportunity to be a promoter all the way in Bangor, Maine, one of the smallest and most difficult places to generate excitement and revenue. So Vince Jr. came up with the genius idea of taping the matches and shipping those tapes across state lines to get people to start watching wrestling on television. Some people looked at this as undercutting or stealing from other territories. But over the next decade, Vince helped his father bring the business to new heights, bringing in stars like Muhammad Ali and tripling their television ratings in the region. However, the landscape of wrestling would shift dramatically when in 1982 his father was falling deathly ill from cancer. He wanted the WWF to remain a Northeast promotion and control the New York City area, but Vince Jr. had big dreams of becoming a national promotion and establishing a global presence. He bought the company and and shortly after, his father passed away. Now Vince was on a warpath to infiltrate every territory and take their business. But before we dive deeper into Vince's evil plan, it's becoming more difficult to protect yourself online. Scammers are becoming more sophisticated and it's almost impossible to keep yourself safe. That's why I've partnered with Guardio. Guardio is a cross-platform solution that creates a secure environment for its users as they surf the web. Guardio detects and blocks phishing links and scams and prevents you from falling victim to them. After installing Guardio, a free security scan will detect any existing threats found on your device and once you activate your account, these threats will be eliminated. Guardio will also notify you in real time once your data is leaked somewhere on the web. These leaks happen daily, so you'll be ahead of the scammers in cases where your passwords or credit card are exposed. Get Guardio now to protect your online browsing information, avoid installing malware and falling victim to scams, and get real-time alerts when your information could be at risk. Use the link in the description or go to guard.io slash patrickcc and get 20% off the monthly subscription. Thanks, Guardio. And that started with Andre the Giant. Standing at 7 foot 4 inches and over 500 pounds, Andre was a sight to behold and everyone around the world was eager to watch him compete. While working for Vincent, Andre would travel across territory lines and get paid a fee to help draw bigger crowds to smaller promotions. Hulk Hogan was another traveling star who was based out of Florida but would cross territory lines for a fee. But when Vince took over, he put an end to this. 
wrestlers signed to the WWF would only be able to wrestle for the shows he controlled, which was basically every state from Pennsylvania to Maine. This business practice is extremely common now, as you never see a football player jump from one game in the NFL to one game in the XFL, or a fighter have one match in the UFC, then a fight in Bellator, then back to UFC. They sign exclusive contracts for a certain number of matches. But back then, Vince's business practices were considered destructive to this industry. He began signing top talent from all territories to exclusive contracts with the WWF. Some of those wrestlers included Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan, Rocky Johnson, Roddy Piper, Bret Hart, Mr. T, Randy Savage, The Ultimate Warrior, Ricky Steamboat, just to name a few. Vince started the Atlantic and Pacific Wrestling Corporation by partnering with Mike LaBelle in Southern California. Then he purchased Mike's shares of the company in 1982, which gave him full control of New York City, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles. To continue his dominance, he used his relationships at War TV to pay $2,500 a week for a Saturday morning time slot on Los Angeles's Channel 9 KHJ TV. But McMahon didn't expect to make a dime. He saw TV as a promotional expense to boost the gates of live shows. The WWF was being broadcasted nationally on Monday nights on the USA Network, so the whole country was being exposed to the brand. But that wasn't enough for Vince. He began a full-on invasion strategy to take out all his competitors city by city. Like when he acquired a local TV station, WAKR 23 out of Akron, Ohio, with reach to Cleveland on January 8, 1983. Then later that year, the WWF debuted on WCPO 9 in Cincinnati, which was an established Georgia Championship Wrestling territory. From there, the WWF entered World Championship Wrestling territory in Dayton, Ohio, purchasing the exclusive rights from WKEF 22 to replace the WCW broadcast with WWF's broadcast. One by one, Vince would enter a city controlled by another promotion, then buy out their TV time slot to air WWF. If he couldn't buy out their TV slot, then he would buy out their top talent, but most of the time, he did both. On an infamous day now known as Black Saturday, July 14, 1984, Vince McMahon appeared on the Saturday time slot on TBS that regularly featured Georgia Championship Wrestling for over a decade. Vince walks on screen after purchasing the company in the time slot to basically flex and say the World Wrestling Federation is now taking over. It is indeed a pleasure to be associated with WTBS and we promise to bring you the greatest in professional wrestling entertainment in the world today. Jim Ross, a legend known for being WWE's commentator and its goal Golden years, said he once overheard several NWA promoters considering getting McMahon killed while in the stall of a public bathroom. In, in those days, it was like when you, from their standpoint, invaded their territory. Uh, it was like, well, okay, Dems is not just fighting words. It's like, there's so many, so many times when people threatened me, uh, and it was like, I, the last guy I said, like, you better get, if you want to take credit for it. <laughs> You better get me quick. Now, it can't be confirmed if this was a serious consideration or tongue in cheek, but it can't be denied how much men like Jim Crockett, Bill Watts, despised Vince for taking away their livelihoods. However, others just look at this as natural competition. America was founded on capitalism, and you should not get comfortable as a business person because eventually someone is going to come and take your spot. If you don't adapt, you die. And by 1988, Vince McMahon fully decimated the territory system. Now the WWF was the biggest and best national wrestling promotion in the sport. This made it extremely easy for Vince to acquire the best talent throughout the 90s, as the World Wrestling Federation became home to rising stars like The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Matt and Jeff Hardy, Triple H, Mick Foley, Kane, The Rock. It seemed like Vince's only competition was with himself. They were selling out stadiums all over the country and broadcasting their events nationally every week. With that being said, the pressure to remain number one was at an all-time high. The matches needed to be bigger. The stakes needed to be higher. Vince wrote in more gimmick matches like ladder matches, table matches, or weirder matches like casket matches and dumpster matches, which meant you had to finish your opponent by putting them in a casket or a dumpster. They even had weird ones like the boiler room match or the hog pen match, which involved wrestling in mud with pigs. But there's no doubt that the hell in a Cell match which featured a 16-foot steel cage that was designed to have wrestlers thrown from the top or through the middle was the most electrifying way to watch two people wrestle. It didn't matter that it was fake because those guys were actually putting their body and their lives on the line for our entertainment and Vince's money. It was only a matter of time before one of those high-flying stunts ended in disaster and in 1999 at Over the Limit that's exactly what happened.
Owen Hart, who was portraying a superhero called the Blue Blazer, fell from 90 feet in the air during a botched entrance stunt where he was flying over the crowd into the ring. After the fall, he suffered internal bleeding and passed away right there in the stadium. They even announced his death on the show, but Vince said the show must go on, and they proceeded to finish the event like this extreme tragedy did not happen. I have the unfortunate responsibility let everyone know that Owen Hart has died. Vince doubled down on his decision to continue the show in an interview in 2001 with Playboy. If you could do it over, would you still hold the show that night? I just guessed that it was what Owen would want, so you'd do it again? I think so. Vince did not just portray a character of a ruthless businessman, that is who he was, but it proved to be the right path to success. 98 and 99 was their peak in terms of ratings and overall viewership, averaging multiple millions of viewers per episode. By the early 2000s, the WWF was generating half a billion dollars in revenue each year. The high intensity matches did not stop. However, the late 90s and early 2000s definitely saw a shift to more in-depth storytelling, which brings us to the infamous Attitude Era. This era is defined as the most ruthless, chaotic, over-the-top violent, and edgy time in WWE history. Scripts were changed the day before, the day of, or even in the ring. The wrestlers were rugged, rude, and in your face. And Vince found himself at the center of these stories because what is more anarchist than beefing with your own boss. Vince portrayed the character of a manic, power-hungry, yet also kind of pathetic CEO of the company. His rivalry with Steve Austin, which began in 97 after Austin hit his boss with a stunner, drove ratings through the roof. This beef was insane. Austin once held McMahon at gunpoint in the ring, although the gun was fake. He drove down the ring with a beer truck and sprayed Vince down with a fire hose of cores. He even snuck into the hospital where Vince was injured and beat him up on the bed. This all culminated with Austin having a full-on match against Vince and his son Shane. This storyline set the tone that Vince being intertwined and involved with the lore was good for business. Then again, Stone Cold Steve Austin was such a superstar that he could beef with a mop and it would be entertaining. In the Attitude Era, you could no longer just be an athlete to be a WWE star. You needed to have personality, charisma, excellent speaking abilities to be able to sell a fight and keep these millions of fans engaged. And if you didn't, well then the writers would come up with your storyline. And you won't believe some of these shocking and twisted narratives that Vince approved or came up with himself. In one of the most bizarre storylines, Kane announced that he was driving late at night with Katie Vick, a girl he loved since he was a teenager. He could not drive stick and they crashed, where she ultimately lost her life. Then Kane attends her open casket and for six minutes on live television he fondles her corpse, undresses her lifeless body and gets intimate with her before grabbing her internal organs and drinking the blood from them. I'm going to give you what you want. And I'm going to take what I always wanted. Or what about the time when Chris Jericho ambushed China, tied her up in a dark room, and began torturing her by beating her with a hammer, which actually broke her thumb so her painful screams were real? Ah! Ah! Vince was a big fan of humiliation, so he developed the Kiss My Ass Club, where a total of six men were forced to get on their knees and kiss his backside in front of millions of people. Most of the time, this was to save their job, or just to embarrass them on a power trip. I should also know that Vince gave the world the satisfaction of being humiliated as he scripted himself getting his face shoved in Rikishi and the Big Show's backsides. Now, most people like to default to all of this being entertainment, like, sure, they push some boundaries, but it's all fake, right? But as time went on, and wrestlers spoke about their behind-the-scenes experiences, and Vince McMahon being accused of sexual assault and trafficking women, some of these storylines felt more like a glimpse into the reality of Vince McMahon's private life. Vince often used his daughter, Stephanie, for his dark storylines, probably because her loyalty convinced her to never say no to him. Like when she was going to get married in the ring to her fiancé, Test, only for Triple H to interrupt the wedding with a video of himself drugging, kidnapping, marrying, and then sleeping with Stephanie while she was unconscious, which led to this infamous promo. Come on out, you rapist! But Stephanie was the subject of another kidnapping, this time by The Undertaker, who brought her out tied on a crucifix-like structure before one of his disciples began ordaining the marriage. In a promo that fans now believe is more of an admission of Stephanie's reality, she says that Vince trafficked his own daughter. Stephanie also admitted that he attempted to push an incest angle. My dad did approach me about 
wanting to be the father of my baby on in a storyline for TV, which again is the only the second time I've ever actually said no to him for something he wanted to do. And uh, that one was just a little too gross, actually. It's completely disgusting, and I don't find the entertainment value in it at all. But that didn't stop her from kissing him on the mouth. Yeah, I'll think about it. But Vince just could not stop coming up with tropes that involve men preying on women. Vince came up with a storyline for Diamond Dallas Page to stalk The Undertaker's wife. DDP says to this day he regrets agreeing to be a part of this narrative. What I should have done was shook everyone's hands and said, I love the idea, but not for DDP. A few years later, this is what Vince said he was going to do to The Undertaker's wife and kids. You don't realize what I want to do, do you? Terrorists are gonna burn down the Undertaker's house. Yeah. His children are gonna be kidnapped. His wife, she's gonna be raped by a motorcycle gang right in front of the Undertaker. That's the plan I want to implement it, damn it. Finally, Vince was able to find a woman who could take his twisted ideas to a whole new level, as he scripted himself a mistress, Trish Stratus. Trish played a character of a woman who slept with the boss to advance her place in the company. At one point, they even wrote that Vince's actual wife, Linda, was so ill she needed 24-hour nursing care and was on copious amounts of drugs. He then brought her out in front of the entire world to make out with Trish right in front of his wife. Vince was brutal towards his wife. He even wrote in a scene where his kids repeatedly slap their own mother to sell a promo. Whatever it takes to get ratings, right? And even though Trish was doing everything she could to advance her place in the company, it wouldn't be long before she was the one who would get humiliated, as he once even stripped her down in the ring and forced her to bark like a dog. He even tried to get her to join the Kiss My Ass Club. Oh, I'm gonna unbuckle my belt but The Rock saved her. Vince's idea of easing up on women was by giving them a new match gimmick, the bra and panties match. This match gimmick was when the female wrestlers would only win the match if they stripped their opponent down to their bra and panties. They also had wet t-shirt contests and spanking matches. Vince was constantly writing storylines where women had to provide him with some sort of sexual favor. How badly do you want to be a WWF superstar? Tori Wilson spoke recently about how she never wanted to play the sexy role and how she tried to convince writers to get her to do more stunts. Fit Finley was amazing putting matches together and just trying to make us look the best he could. Yeah. Uh, and I often would ask him if I could please get thrown into the stairs or like crazy, not crazy things, but like, you know, I just really wanted to get hurt. Yeah, there's this like baseball slide into a chair. Like it's yeah, some part of your hall of fame reel. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I Stuff like that. So like, I wanted to do more of that, but it was la I was like laughed, kind of laughed at. Ultimately, being constantly forced to do these raunchy matches and skits that only showcased her sexuality made her despise the business long after she retired. But there's also something about wrestling that has always felt super dark to me. And um, like, I'm just really sensitive to it. So mm -hmm. like, I, I say no to a lot of signings because I like, I feel like, like that darkness and it doesn't feel good it's taken a long time like there i didn't watch wrestling i didn't want anything to do with wrestling for many years after i left mostly because i just i i just had like a certain amount of like ptsd from like being so vulnerable out there and feeling like I was put in this kind of like raunchy role that wasn't me. So while most people thought that these raunchy matches, risque promos, and twisted narratives were just Vince McMahon going over the top to boost ratings, we found out two decades later that it was even darker behind the scenes. It was so bad for Ashley Massaro that it ended her life. Masaro was first introduced to the WWE in 2005 when she met a casting director during a swimsuit pageant searching for contestants for the upcoming 2005 Raw Diva search competition. She decided that this was the right decision to finally shoot for her dream job as a WWE wrestler. Upon winning, she received $250,000 and a one-year contract with the WWE. Ashley faced significant challenges during her early WWE career. August 22, 2005, she was attacked backstage by fellow divas, 
Candace Michelle and Tori Wilson, leaving her with a back injury. Despite this, she recovered and won the first ever three-on-two bra and panties match. After this, she continued to appear in the promotion, but later suffered a severe leg injury on February 20th during a women's battle royale against Mickey James. The injury included a spinal fracture, a severed nerve, and multiple broken bones, requiring a metal plate and screws be put in during surgery. After recovering, she returned until 2008 where she asked to be released from her contract due to her daughter having medical problems. For years, Ashley would be relatively out of the spotlight until 2016 when she would join a class action lawsuit against the WWE, alleging Vince was a part of one of the most horrifying crime cover-ups in history. Ashley Massaro was a strong supporter of the US military and was enthusiastic about opportunities to meet and help the troops. So in 2006, Ashley was excited to be selected to go to Kuwait for their annual tribute to the troops tour. However, the tour started off with issues. In Saudi Arabia, Massaro experienced harsh treatment from several men because of cultural reasons which made her uncomfortable. And after arriving in Kuwait, she began suffering from menstrual cramps and was taken to a military base for dehydration treatment. At the base, she was given an IV and later, a man wearing an orange t-shirt and cargo shorts, claiming to be a US Army doctor, injected her with a substance that made her body paralyzed while still being conscious. He then moved her to a non-treatment room where the man violently R-worded and sodomized her while a woman guarded the door. After returning to the US, WWE's Dr. Rios called a meeting with Ashley Massaro to discuss the incident. She was unsure how he knew about it, but suspected it might have been someone on the tour who reported it. She agreed to tell him what happened as long as Rios kept it confidential. However, Dr. Rios told Vince McMahon, who then brought in executives for a meeting where Massaro was asked to detail what happened in Kuwait. She said, Vince did at least apologize for what I went through, but then stressed that if I disclosed this incident, it would ruin the relationship between the WWE and the US military. He told me to not let one bad experience ruin the good work they were doing. His lack of sensitivity and referring to my ordeal as one bad experience left me speechless. In a filing the next month, WWE called the claim a stale and baseless allegation and denied Massaro had ever reported a sexual assault to anyone affiliated with WWE, saying she had been heard telling others that the doctor had done an inappropriate pelvic exam before a judge dismissed the case in 2018. Less than a year later, Ashley wrote letters back to all of her fans that were sharing love and support for her bravery. Then the next day, Ashley tragically passed away on May 16th, 2019. She was 39 years old and is survived by her daughter. An important statement that Ashley made during this lawsuit was never released to the public until 2024 to back up Vince's new allegations by Janelle Grant, which we'll get to in a second. Ashley's statement said the following, During my time with the WWE, I had observed Vince McMahon making out with other divas in the locker room, but he never paid any attention to me, and I assumed I was not his type. This changed after my Playboy cover was released. I was fortunate enough to be allowed to fly on the company jet and stay at the same hotels as the executives for a period of time. On one of these occasions, Vince was attempting to get me alone with him in his hotel room late at night and I felt extraordinarily uncomfortable. He began calling the hotel room phone and my cell phone non-stop. I called Kevin Dunn, a producer, to explain the situation and he said I should tell Vince I was not feeling well and would see him on TV the next day, so I did. Immediately after that night, Vince started writing my promos for me. Vince does not write promos for female wrestlers, that is the job of the creative department, and he certainly wouldn't have, under any normal circumstances, written a promo for me. But he did, and the promos were written with a clear intention of ruining my career. In addition, after that night, each time I walked by him, he would make vulgar sexual comments that were clearly designed to make me uncomfortable. These claims can be backed up by former boyfriend and wrestler Paul London, who said that Vince was constantly putting predatory pressure on her. Many times when she would she would be crying to me because Vince was propositioning her to to fly on the jet with them. Like Kevin Dunn, Bucktooth Bucky would be uh, telling her that she has to fly on the jet with them, or that he might, you know, possibly, or every now and then, if she was at the, you know, they'd always put the divas up at like the TV hotel or whatever. You know, he'd be knocking on her door and you know trying to get her to answer, and it's just like. I'm shocked this Vince stuff 
is just now coming out. The walls were slowly closing in on Vince McMahon. He was able to escape Ashley Massaro's horrible allegations, but it was only a matter of time before his evil past would catch up to him. In 2022, Vince McMahon agreed to pay more than $12 million to four women who were affiliated with the WWE over the course of 16 years. It's alleged that the women also signed agreements which prohibited them from discussing their relationships with McMahon. The settlements include a $7.5 million pact with a former wrestler who alleged that Vince McMahon coerced her into giving him oral sex and then demoted her, and ultimately declined to renew her contract in 2005 after she resisted further sexual encounters. This controversy was enough to make Vince McMahon finally step down as CEO of the company, but in January of 2024, Vince was slapped with another lawsuit, this time jam-packed full of evidence that would make the whole world understand who he truly is. Janelle Grant, a former WWE employee, accused Vince McMahon of abuse, sexual exploitation, and humiliation during his tenure as chief executive. Grant alleged that McMahon lured her with promises of career advancement, but then exploited and trafficked her to other men within the company. Grant first met McMahon in March of 2019 through a manager in her apartment building, where McMahon also lived. She was seeking employment after her parents' debts. McMahon promised her a job at WWE and showered her with gifts, but the meetings turned inappropriate when one time McMahon approached her in his underwear and pressured her into sexual situations. As such, when McMahon pushed Miss Grant for a physical relationship in return for long promise employment at WWE, she felt trapped in an impossible situation, submitting to McMahon's sexual demands or facing ruin. Miss Grant feared she had everything to lose and face negative consequences no matter what happened. In June of 2019, Grant began working as an administrator coordinator in WWE's legal department. After giving her a job, Vince McMahon's sexual demands increased, and he began sharing explicit photos and videos of her with other WWE employees and executives. Despite Miss Grant's expressions of unhappiness and attempts to end the sexual relationship, she came to understand that McMahon expected the physical relationship to continue as a part of her employment. In March of 2020, McMahon began sharing actually explicit photographs and videos of Miss Grant, including pornographic content he recorded with other men both inside and outside the company. You can even see these text messages of him admitting to doing so. She even tried to express that she did not want an associate named Johnny, aka John Laranatus, receiving pictures of her. The lawsuit then goes on to describe not one, or a few, but countless extremely detailed situations in which Vince used his power to break her down, exploit her sex demand and force her to give herself to him and his associates, whether it was by serving executives during work hours in offices, or serving WWE superstars to keep them satisfied and prevent them from leaving the company. Control that can only be described as sexual slavery. If you read this text message, you can see an example of him trying to coordinate a schedule for his associates to take turns with this woman, only for her to respond that she does not want to and for him to keep begging. Multiple other text messages from Vince were shown in the lawsuit where he deeply explains his desire to traffic her to men throughout the industry. As one example of McMahon's extreme depravity, on May 9th, 2020, he defecated on Miss Grant during a threesome, and then commanded her to continue pleasuring his friend with feces in her hair and running down her back. McMahon and his friend actively resumed the threesome which lasted over an hour and a half, while Miss Grant remained covered in McMahon's filth. Naturally, when people hear about allegations like this, they tend to consider the alternative. Maybe she wanted this. Maybe she liked this. Maybe she is just using him for a payday after consenting to this depraved lifestyle. And maybe in the beginning she did consent to these weird kinks. But it's very easy to see how these things can get out of control very quickly. A clear line between fantasy and reality needs to be drawn, and evidently, that wasn't the case. Now people will also wonder how did this get so bad? Well, a lot of people downplay the impact of psychological manipulation and how people can lose themselves, go numb, and just start obliging to the demands of their abuser. The lawsuit also quotes Vince texting her saying, I want to drive you lower and lower, so low that you beg me to sell you. In early 2022, Vince said that his wife Linda found out about he and Janelle's relationship and threatened a divorce, so he stopped all communication with her to save his marriage and avoid a public fallout. He demanded that she sign a non-disclosure agreement in which McMahon agreed to pay her $3 million to keep their relationship confidential. However, after the anonymous tip in 2022 that led to a board investigation and a multi-million dollar payout to a few women, Vince stopped paying Janelle after the initial $1 million installment. Vince
Vince has vehemently denied any wrongdoing. He also put out a statement saying he and Janelle had a consensual relationship that lasted a little less than three years and ended in early 2022. He also added that Grant texted him explicit images of herself and messages expressing love for him, along with her wanting clothes and other gifts. We remain confident the evidence will prove Miss Grant's allegations are false and her complaint is nothing more than a fabricated, vindictive narrative from a disgruntled former girlfriend. But in July of 2023, federal prosecutors executed a search warrant for McMahon's phone and served him with a grand jury subpoena. And it seems like since then, which has now been a year, the feds have been building a case against him. Just a month ago, they asked Janelle if she would agree to essentially put her case on hold while they investigate him further. She agreed. So it seems like any day now the feds could present the world with years worth of evidence proving him to be the exact same depraved, disgusting, abusive, power-absorbed freak he conveyed himself to be on television for the past 35 years.